Hello and welcome everyone to a webinar hosted by the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox or CCAST team. Uh, this is Matt Graybaugh. I'm a science coordinator with the Science Applications Program for the Fish and Wildlife Service and I sit down here in Tucson, Arizona. If you are new to CCAST, uh, this is a collaboration of over 100 people from dozens of natural resource conservation and management organizations in the West. CCAST is coordinated by myself and the Fish and Wildlife Service along with Genevieve Johnson from the Bureau of Reclamation and the University of Arizona. CCAST is intended to improve communication and coordination on how we address challenges to natural resource conservation and management. CCAST currently hosts over 60 online case studies, which we'll provide a link to later in the presentation. And we're excited to share that as of February of this year, our case studies have been viewed over 22,000 times. This year, as part of CCAST, we're focusing our efforts on establishing a non-native aquatics community of practice that will include case studies on research and control efforts, syntheses on lessons learned for different non-native aquatic taxa, and monthly webinars, which is what we're here for today. And with that, I will stop talking and hand it over to Alex Caberly. Thanks, Matt. Let me just switch the slide. Okay. Yeah, thanks. So my name is Alex Caberly and I'm a CCAS research specialist with the University of Arizona. And I'm helping coordinate the efforts with um, the non-native aquatics work for CCAS this upcoming year. So today um, we have Brian Healy and Brian will be presenting a webinar on native fish conservation and non-native trout removal in Grand Canyon National Park. Brian is a PhD candidate at the, in aquatic ecology at Utah State University. And he is also the fisheries program manager for the Native Fish Ecology and Conservation Program in Grand Canyon National Park. So it sounds like he's pretty busy between graduate school and working at the uh, Grand Canyon National Park. So Brian's research in Grand Canyon looks at the effectiveness of conservation actions for imperiled native fish communities, particularly in arid land habitats. His dissertation at Utah State focuses on understanding the population level responses of fishes to the mechanical suppression of non-native fish like brown trout. And also he's assessing translocated populations of the federally endangered hump humpback chub. So the profile photo of Brian on the left with the glacier is surprisingly not in Arizona, but it's in Alaska. And the uh, photo on the right is Brian holding a brown trout, which we're gonna hear more about soon. And as uh, Brian was emailing me photos to use for CCAST, he uh, told me with a few trout photos like the trout that he's holding there that, um, and I'm quoting this, that no adult humpback chub was safe around those. So to learn more about this work, I'd now like to turn it over to Brian Healy. All right, thank you so much. Let me um, share my screen here. Oops, hold on one second. Okay, can everybody see that, Alex? All right. Yes. Um, th thank you, every thanks to everyone who um, showed up to watch this webinar today. I know there's lots of different competing uh, Zoom con conferences going on right now, and I really appreciate it. I'm really um, thankful to Alex and Matt for providing this forum um, for us to share our work in Grand Canyon in the conservation of um, our unique endem endemic uh, fishes. I'm not advancing. Okay, there we go. Um, first, I want to acknowledge the many different um, uh, funders and supporters of this project or these projects, including the Bureau of Reclamation, who funded the, the vast majority of the logistics, um, National Park Service, Grand County Conservancy, and the Johnson Foundation. Uh, the Center for Colorado River Studies funded the first um, semester or two of my graduate program. Um, and and uh, I'm grateful to um, USGS for their support as well, and Utah State, um, Arizona Game and Fish Department, Fish and Wildlife Service, and of course, the many, many volunteers and technicians that help support this work um, over the years. Um, this is not a project, a uh, set of projects that I put together by myself. There's a long list of collaborators that contributed, you know, very um, passionately to the development and implementation and monitoring 
an analysis of these um, projects. Uh, I wanted to especially thank my um, graduate committee who have been supporting me um, and taking me on as a, a non-traditional uh, older student. I put Faith Booty, um, Mark McKinstry, Mary Connor, Jack Schmidt, and Charles E. Kulik. That's my supervisor at Grand Canyon. Uh, on the way to support me to go to school while um, also working. And also um, our team, Emily Omana Smith, um, Rebecca Kohler, and Bob Shelley, who are um, keeping things going there while I'm um, off at school. Uh, for, so for my talk today, I'm going to start by um, outlining some challenges to effectively conserving native fishes in, in the novel environments that we're all faced with, including in Grand Canyon. I'm going to focus on two tributary case studies, um, invasive trout control and translocations of endangered humpback chub. I just really wanted to drive this point home that tributaries to um, main stem larger rivers really can provide um, opportunities for conservation that might not be as, as um, easy to, to conduct in a large main stem river with lots of different um, uses and impacts. And then finally, um, at the end, I'm going to discuss some lessons learned and design considerations that we've come across um, throughout the implementation and planning of these projects. First, I just wanted to put our work into a broader perspective. Um, so freshwaters only make up about 1% of global water supply, but they contain 40 to 43% of the fish diversity in the world. Um, and Freshwater biodiversity is at a greater decline than in terrestrial and, or marine habitats. So we really are challenged to attempt to um, bend this curve back and slow that rate of decline. Um, in the U.S., uh, two um, constraints to conservation I'm going to be focusing on today are um, our water scarcity and also many native species. Uh, in the upper left here, we have a um, water scarcity index, which is the amount of water used versus that, um, or the demand versus that available. And on the bottom here is the, um, and it shows an index of non-native to native species in um, major watersheds. Um, just to highlight that the Western US is really um, constrained by um, these two impacts. Nowhere um, are these and probably in the Colorado River, which has been deemed one of America's most endangered rivers by um, conservation organizations. Um, hey, Brian. And, and, yeah. Hey, sorry to interject. Your audio is getting a little, uh, it's getting a little cut out. We're wondering if maybe you try turning off your video, if uh, the audio would be clear. Okay. Thanks for letting me know. Let me see. Okay, I think you must have shot it off. I think we're okay. Is that yeah, better? Yeah, that sounds better. Okay. If it, if it gets a little, uh, uh, if it sounds a little cut off again, we can just try having you call in, but that does sound better without your video. Okay, great. It's better for me not to stare at my own face too. Okay, <laughs> anyway, that sounds okay. better now. Okay, good. Um, okay, so... Uh, the Colorado River has been constrained um, by the construction of 15 large main stem dams. Um, and those dams and this elaborate plumbing system are um, adequately portrayed on this high country news uh, diagram here in the lower left. And these reservoirs store seven times the mean annual flow of the Colorado River Basin, which is an incredible st statistic, I think. Uh, but also there's um, hundreds of water diversions and um, as well that are impacting uh, the flows in the river. Also, um, the novel environments that have been created upstream of dams and reservoirs and also in the tailwaters below them have been, um, are you okay, sorry. sorry. Okay, I'll keep going. Um, Many different uh, non-native sport fish have been introduced in these areas that uh, tend to thrive in these novel habitats, and they also heavily impact our native fish community by, through predation and um, competition. Uh, that being said, the Colorado River has a really high degree of endemism among its fishes. 75% um, of uh, the fish in the basin are endemic to the Colorado River. 
Um, this is the eight large river fishes that are common in the main stem reaches, um, of which 75% are endemic. However, of these, um, half of them are listed on the Endangered Species Act. So national parks can play a potentially significant role in conservation of native fish in the Colorado River Basin. Um, there are nine different NPS units located along um, the river or their tributaries or its tributaries. Um, and the NPS generally has a mandate to conserve resources uh, natural resources over other uses like recreation um, or water use, I suppose. Um, however, there are some exceptions that are usually included within the enabling legislation within park units. So, for example, Grand Canyon is sandwiched between two natural recreation areas that um, do manage for non native sport fish opportunities, fishing opportunities. Um, that being said, um, Grand Canyon, even though it's um, between these two rec areas, it, it really could provide one of the last best places for um, conservation of the unique endemic fishes in the Colorado River Basin. Our challenge then is to, to develop, test, and monitor management strategies to conserve these native fish under these novel conditions that have been created in the basin. Okay, I wanted to briefly discuss some of the ecology of the Colorado River fishes. So this um, group of fish evolved in disturbance prone ev environments. Um, in the upper right here, I have uh, hydrographs for 10, 10 years, uh, water years in Brainsville Creek, which is one of our um, study areas we'll be discussing today. And as you can see, there's really great interannual variability um, in the flow regime when, when we have, like, we can have really strong, spring snow melt flows or not at all. And then in the summer months, we get these um, intermittent but intense monsoon storm events. Um, so these fishes have evolved in sort of environment as well as in a seasonally warm thermal regime. Um, so they can withstand temperatures between you know, basically zero degrees or one degree all the way up to about 30. Um, these fishes have developed these unique life history strategies to cope with this environment, including longevity, and, and, they, and many of them um, are highly fecund. Um, these long-lived fish um, can take advantage of maybe only a few good years for spawning, when other years might be not be very good for reproduction. Um, they're highly migratory in some cases, um, and many of them have unique uh, morphological adaptations to either um, avoid predation by the one large predator, the Colorado pike minnow, um, and, and also um, deal with the dynamic environment. Hey, Brian. Brian, are you still there? Hello? Hello, we can hear you if you wanna go ahead and keep going, Brian. Okay, I'm gonna try. It's really difficult of the, because of the echo on my end. Uh, as long as it sounds okay, I'm going to do my best, but it's really, really tough. Yeah, it's tough for us. And you muted your computer? It says I am muted. Are your speakers? Um, let me try. Okay, let me try that. Okay. Okay. How about that? That seems better if you can still hear me. Okay, yes, I think we're good to go. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, that sounds okay. better. Great, sorry everybody for yeah, the, thanks, the complications there. Okay, um, where was I? Uh, so yes, um, the dam um, created these really um, novel conditions that were um, really more con conducive to maintaining um, sport fish than um, 
our native species. And this is just an example of that. This is the um, pre-dam river on the top and the right, which was highly turbid and, um, and much clearer and more uh, suitable for um, rainbow trout below the dam. Um, so in, in Grand Canyon, with the closure of Lynn Canyon Dam in, in 1964, there were profound changes to the hydrology and also uh, the thermal regime in addition to the sediment regime. On the, in the lower left here, I've plotted the minimum uh, growth and reproduction thresholds for um, humpback chub, which is an endangered species in Grand Canyon. As, and as you can see, after the reservoir filled, there really was not um, very few periods where growth and almost no periods where reproduction could occur in the river. But that being said, Grand Canyon has maintained the largest humpback chub population left in the Colorado River Basin, and it's been centered on uh, the Little Colorado River here in the photos. Um, and as such, tributaries do provide this great conservation benefit um, to mainstream populations. Nonetheless, in Grand Canyon, uh, three of our eight native species have been extirpated, um, and, and the two remaining endangered species, including chub as well as razorback sucker, um, remain. However, the razorback sucker are incredibly rare and appear to be um, possibly in decline um, recently. So again, our challenge is to, is to determine ways to conserve these riverine fishes. Um, one way is to restore habitat through management of the dam. Um, as an example, there's been a couple of different um, high uh, flow experiments that have been used to create, to benefit the values for which Grand Canyon have been created. Um, however, these, the outcomes of these projects can sometimes be difficult to predict. Um, as an example, in the lower left is an example of a high flow experiment that was designed to build beaches and create backwater habitats that could be um, good rearing areas for humpback chub. Um, and one of those experiments resulted in a really large increase in production of non-native rainbow trout. And another one is this low summer steady flow experiment where we have low stable flows during the summer months, summer months which could allow for stable, warm rearing habitats um, near shore. But this sort of a experiment might cost $23 million or more in lost hydropower revenues. In addition to that, um, there are many different stakeholders involved in the management of um, Glen Canyon Dam. Um, oftentimes, these stakeholders have competing objectives. They advise, um, this, in this table on the left, are the list of stakeholders involved in advising the Secretary of Interior on the operations on Glen Canyon Dam. Uh, through the Glen Canyon Dam Adaptive Management Program. So creating consensus among all these groups um, to, to develop flows just for um, native fish can be uh, challenging. Alternatively, we can manipulate pop populations um, directly through hatchery prop propagation and stocking or translocations and of course um, non-native fish control, uh, which I'll be discussing today. Okay, I wanted to briefly orient everybody to our study area. Grand Canyon, of course, is in the northwest corner of Arizona. And I'll be discussing work on four different tributaries today, including the Little Colorado River, which is again the source of humpback chub, Bright Angel Creek, Shinmu Creek, and also Havasu Creek. Um, and an important point to make here is that these tributaries, for the most part, um, are characterized by having natural flow and thermal regimes. Um, relative to the main stem. So both um, non-native fish control and translocations of the humpback chub have been included as conservation measures in biological opinions on the operations of Glen Canyon Dam, um, even as recently as um, uh, 2016. And we have taken these uh, conservation measures and de developed detailed implementation and monitoring plans um, that are included in our non-native, or sorry, our native fish, sorry, comprehensive fisheries management plan, which was completed in 2013. All right, um, on to our first case study, which is non-native fish control. So, um, 
trout were, trout were introduced by agencies, including the Park Service, into tributaries in Grand Canyon beginning in the 1920s. And these activities were documented in um, early Grand Canyon pu publications like this Nature Notes from 1932. Uh, the Park Service stopped stocking in 1964, but the Arizona Game and Fish Department continued to stock rainbow trout near Lee's Ferry upstream of the park until the 1990s and also over the last year or so. Um, our focus of suppression is on brown trout. This is a globally invasive species. Um, it's been introduced in, into multiple con um, habitats across many con continents, both inadvertently and intentionally. I can thrive in altered habitats like those below the dams. Um, and it can have really severe impacts on the receiving fish, native fish community through both predation and competition. And here we have a, a map in the lower left of their native range, which is in um, Western Asia and Europe and North Africa, and their um, introduced range in red. To drive this point home, I've um, pulled out a plot from some research conducted by um, David Ward at USGS, which is a comparison of basically um, piscivory between rainbow and brown trout on juvenile humpback chub. So in this, these plots here, we have um, chub length on the x-axis and the probability of chub survival on the y. And then um, each plot is a species, brown trout in the lower plot and rainbows in, in, above, in the above upper plot. And you can see um, there he conducted different trials with different temperature regimes. And you need to note the y-axis is much different between these species. And essentially, you really have hardly any chance of survival when faced with a brown trout, even under different size ranges and temperature regimes. And if you're faced with a predator like rainbow trout, um, in, especially in warm environments, as you grow larger, you really outgrow that you know, piscivory risk really quickly. Our study was focused on suppressing brown trout in Bright Angel Creek, which is thought to be the primary source um, and spawning area of brown trout up until recently. Here in this plot, we have um, catch rates of brown trout by river mile with the location of the Bright Angel Creek inflow um, listed there. And as you can see, um, much high, the high, highest densities of brown trout are found adjacent to um, Bright Angel Creek itself. Historically, um, many of our native fishes were recorded um, either in or near Bright Angel Creek. Um, however, once um, Salmonids were introduced, and of course the river conditions changed as well, in the main stem, um, we lost many of those species. And at the beginning of our study, we really only found speckled bait and bluehead sucker as uh, residents in the creek itself, with uh, seasonal movements of flannel moss suckers into the creek um, to spawn but no records of rearing uh, flannel moss suckers um, prior to our study. So the goals of this project were to enhance and restore the native fish populations in the creek to the extent possible, but also um, we wanted to reduce these populations and the dispersal of brown trout into the main stem where they could prey upon humpback chub in the Colorado River. And also it was important for us to foster meaningful relationships with um, traditionally associated American Indian tribes. There are 11 of them that have cultural roots in Grand Canyon. And we, we thought it was important to integrate their perspectives into our management as they were um, quite concerned that the taking of life of non-native fish would, uh, would impact their um, cultural values. Uh, our mechanical removal objectives were to reduce trout by 80% or more. Um, and this was something that we Melissa Trammell pulled out of the literature, but um, there really isn't a lot of good information on, on a level of removal that you need before you might see a positive response in native fish. But this was what um, we came up with. Um, and also, of course, we wanted to maintain and improve native fish populations. And finally, when our trout reduction objectives were met, we had an objective of translocating the humpback chub um, to Bright Angel Creek itself. At the beginning of our study, we hypothesized that brown or rainbow trout had a very strong negative impact on uh, the native fish community. But we, we thought that over time we could suppress the trout and this would result in a positive population response in the native fishes and we'd see an increase. 
However, uh, we did recognize that there might be some uncertainty related to how the population dynamics of both non-native and native fish might relate to environmental variation like um, differences in the thermal regime or interannual um, variation in flooding. But also, uh, and very importantly, um, we wanted to ensure that we weren't doing harm by repeatedly mechanically um, or electrofishing the native fish community and potentially leading to a population level um, impact through um, injuries. So our research objectives were to quantify the temporal trends and abundance of both the non-native and native fish concurrent with streamlined trout suppression, as well as assess the importance of abiotic and biotic drivers in predicting the distribution and abundance of native fishes in the stream. Our sampling regime involved three paths electric fishing throughout the Bright Angel Creek in its entirety, which is about 15 kilometers, with the exception of the very um, headwater, headwater areas near the spring source, um, which was hard to access for our crews. We did some removal there, but not um, as extensive as in lower reaches. Um, and we also installed a resistance board weir near the mouth of Red Angel Creek to intercept and remove brown and rainbow trout on spawning runs out of the main stem during the fall and winter months. Um, and this work all can, occurred approximately between October and um, February between 2012 and 2018. Through the process of our comprehensive fish um, fisheries management plan, we consulted with the tribes associated with Grand Canyon and um, signed an MOA that stipulated that we would put the fish that we removed from the park or from the stream towards um, beneficial use, which included and prioritized human consumption. However, um, as the size structure shifted in the creek over time and we had more small fish uh, two of the tribes requested that we provide some of these smaller fish whole for consumption by their ceremonial eagles, uh, which we did. We also avoided electric fishing sacred areas um, in the stream, which was amounted to about 100 meters of stream. As far as data analysis goes, I'm not going to get too much into details here, but wanted to recognize that we have a paper in review right now that goes into detail on um, on these statistical methodologies. But in summary, um, we use depletion models to estimate abundance for trout and speckled dates um, in each station. And then we sum the total catch of native suckers because in some years we didn't get good depletions on um, suckers. Um, there's low capture probably, probability related to um, small fish. And to assess drivers of the distribution and abundance of native fish in sites, we used generalized linear mixed effects models and tested dis different predictors like trout density, uh, a monsoon and spring flooding index, and thermal variation throughout the creek, and also um, quantified electric fishing effort. Moving into results, uh, between 2012 and 2018, we sampled 877 uh, stations. We removed uh, almost 43,000 brown trout and about 8,000 rainbow trout. And we did indeed see increased recruitment of native fish, including the first records of rearing juvenile um, final mouth suckers as of 2015 when we had suppressed trout, trout by about 60%. Uh, we saw um, trends in abundance decline in both rainbow and brown trout. And just wanted to point out that um, these are scaled the same and obviously there's many more brown trout beginning of the study than rainbows. Um, there's, we saw the steady decline in brown throughout the whole creek, but a little bit more variability in rainbow trout over time. And also we expected that we might see a large con compensatory response in um, survival of juvenile and young of year brown trout with the removal of adults. Um, so we did track the size structure. This is the size structure of brown trout in 2012 at the beginning of the um, study. And here it is in 27 and 2018, 2017-18, excuse me. Uh, we did not see a compensatory response in any of the years that was very significant. Um, but what's interesting here is that we saw a compensatory response in growth rates in young of year, 
um, you can see the mode of the young of year age class is, is much larger at the end of the study with lower densities. Uh, we saw large increases in the abundance of native fish, um, including fl flannel moss suckers, which were absent through 2015. Um, and then in 2017, 2018, we saw really large year classes of all three species. And most of these increases occurred in the lower two reaches, or about um, six or seven kilometers of the stream. Um, that's reaches one and two. The top model to predict native fish distribution and abundance as an aggregate included the spatial thermal variable, trout density, spring flooding index, as well as the monsoon flooding index. Here we have plots of each predictor variable on the x-axis and native fish abundance on the y, with um, each year of the study colored in yellow. And as you can see, when we had really low trout densities, we had um, a large year class of native fish in pink here. Um, and also, the native fish expanded and increased upstream to cooler areas with um, declines in trout. We saw the largest increase in native fish with the um, largest um, magnitude of spring flooding. And also we saw um, weak year classes of native fish with strong monsoons. So in summary, um, mechanical suppression proved to be effective in removing non-native trout and benefiting the net native fish community. Um, and importantly, we saw, it appears that our data supports the idea that um, removing native fish, non-native fish, fish, excuse me, outweighs the potential negative impacts of repeated electric fishing on the native fish community. And also, I wanted to note that brown trout catch rates in the main stem Colorado River adjacent to Bright Angel Creek are at a 20-year low in Grand Canyon. So it appears that it's possible that our work in the tributary may have benefits outside of Bright Angel Creek by reducing dispersal of brown trout. Our native fish abundance was highest in warmest, warmest sites with the highest or the fewest brown trout, um, suggesting that temperature may mediate biotic interactions. And again, we saw that during years of the highest spring flows and weakest monsoons, uh, the greatest year classes of native fish. And following peer review by an expert panel of this work in 2018, it was recommended that we begin translocation to Bright Angel Creek, which is a great segue into the next section of my presentation, the case study on humpback chub translocations. Okay, some quick review. Uh, again, Grand Canyon's population is the largest um, remaining in the Colorado River Basin. Uh, that population was sustained almost solely by reproduction in the one in one tributary in Grand Canyon, which is the Little Colorado River. And as you might suspect, um, having your population reliant on reproduction in one place really puts that at a, puts it at an increased risk of extirpation. If you were to see a new disease outbreak or invasive species um, colonization, but translocations were designed to both enhance juvenile recruitment which was thought to limit the population and also increase population redundancy by establishing new populations outside of the Little Colorado River. Um, in, the, in the late 90s, uh, Valdez and others um, developed a feasibility study to um, establish the second spawning population in Grand Canyon and it included an evaluation of tributary translocations among other actions. They evaluated eight tributaries and the water quality and quantity, uh, types of habitat, and uh, presence of uh, non-native species in each potential tributary. And they prioritized Havasu Creek as the um, first location for translocations. Um, Shinamu Creek was the second priority. Um, and Bright Angel Creek was not actually re recommended as a translocation site given its high density of brown trout. Um, the important take home here with this slide is that these tributaries are all very different. Even Havasu Creek is much smaller than the Little Colorado River, um, although the thermal regimes are similar. Um, also, the non native fish community differs as well. The Little Colorado River has numerous warm water species. Bright Angel, of course, has trout. Uh, Shinmo Creek has just rainbow trout, and um, there are minimal non native species present in Havasu Creek, only a few rainbow trout. 
And these are photos of those um, three translocation sites. This is Shinamu Creek on the left, Havasu Creek in the center, and then um, the translocation site on um, Bright Angel Creek on the right. And this is just to simply show the difference in these three streams, especially relative to what you might consider more traditional um, canyon bound large river habitat for humpback shell lake on the right in Colorado. Um, and then the little Colorado River is on the left. Uh, we had some, there were uncertainties about translocations um, that we tried to address with our monitoring and um, planning, um, including whether chub would remain and survive in the tributaries. And if they um, didn't and they left, would they augment main stem aggregations that were small relic populations located outside of the, um, each one of these tributaries? And an important note here is that Shinmu Creek and Havasu Creek both have waterfalls or potential barriers at, near their mouths. Um, Havasu Creek on the right here is the one potential exception. In 2011, just as we we're to begin translocating Chubb to Havasu Creek, there was um, large magnitude steady equalization flows in the Colorado River that pulled Colorado River water back up and may have allowed a small number of adult humpback chub to um, pass these barrier cascades. But again, if, if these fish leave, they're not expected to come back. Getting into the logistics now, we collected um, juvenile and marvel humpback chub from the Little Colorado River using hoop nets and seines, and later on we we started using um, dip nets to collect larval fish. Those fish were flown out of the Little Colorado River in a helicopter and driven in a hatchery truck to a hatchery where they spent eight to 12 months um, receiving parasite and disease treatments, flow training, um, and pit tagging. We thought it was very important that we have individual marks on these fish so that we could track their survival and growth rates over time. Um, they were also, of course, weighed and measured before um, being put back in a hatchery truck and driven back to the South Rim Hella Base and then flown into um, Grand Canyon tributaries. We also conducted some non-native fish control in Shinamu Creek for the purpose of suppressing brown trout and maximizing the survival of translocated humpback chub. We did this through angling, um, intensive angling, and also electrofishing. But I wanted to point out that this scale was much, much smaller than what I described for Bright Angel Creek. This was um, limited, electrofishing was conducted in mostly limited areas upstream of translocation sites. Um, and we're still trying to understand how effective it, it, those activities were. We also uh, attempt to install pit tag and tennis systems at the mouths of each one of the tributaries. Uh, it proved to be logistically infeasible at Havasu Creek. However, we did install a pit tag antenna at both um, Shinamu Creek and uh, Bright Angel Creek. And this was really important for us to measure dispersal from the tributaries, but also it allowed us to augment our encounter histories with the detections at the antenna to estimate survival, which I'll discuss briefly in a minute. We monitored annual abundance of humpback chub in each one of the tributaries. And we also, um, through mark recapture methods, estimated apparent survival and growth rates. And to try to understand the, um, the contribution towards conservation of the populations, we compared these um, vital rates to those published for juvenile humpback chub in the Little Colorado River. And of course, we also um, monitored for reproduction and recruitment. Um, as far as data analysis, we, so we sampled um, twice a year in each tributary with hoop nets and minnow traps. Um, again, we estimated abundance based on mark recapture and seasonal and annual daily growth rates, as well as um, we now have preliminary true survival estimates that we've, um, as you, we've modeled using a Barker model. We'll discuss that in a second. And um, we also have been monitoring the native fish community in each receiving stream there was some initial concern that releasing humpback chub into these tributaries would potentially impact um, those communities as well. <clears throat> a little water here for a second. Okay, excuse me. Um, we initiated translocations in 2009 in Shinamu Creek 
Um, in between 2009 and 2013, we released just over 1,100 fish. Um, we released almost 2,000 chub in Havasu Creek between 2011 and 2016. And we conducted our first translocation to Bright Angel Creek of 116 individuals in 2018. Um, and I wanted to point out the difference in the size structure between the translocations in um, Shinamu and Havasu Creek in pink and gray versus Bright Angel Creek. Those fish that went into Bright Angel Creek were initially intended for Shinamu Creek in 2014. However, there was a fire there and we held those fish back and later released them in, in uh, Bright Angel as adults. That brings me to my next point. <clears throat> um, in 2014, there was a, a fairly large fire in the Shinmu Creek watershed, um, and then an intense monsoon rainstorm on top of that fire, which washed lots of ash and debris and sediment through the system, and ultimately extirpated native fish and rainbow trout from um, the entire lower reaches of Shinmu Creek. However, since then, uh, rainbow trout that survived in a headwater refuge area have now recolonized the entire stream as well as um, have rain or cycle base. Um, this is a photo of one of our translocation sites pre and post flood. And you can see how much sediment filled that large pool that was chest deep prior to the flood. All right, um, moving on to growth. So I, we have growth rates for each cohort translocated to Shinu and Havasu Creek for both summer and winter compared to the Little Colorado River here. Um, this dashed line represents the, the range of growth rates in juvenile chub published by Maria Jewell in um, 2016. As you can see, in general, um, growth was a little bit higher in the summer than, than uh, the LCR in Shinu Creek and a little bit lower in the winter. But in general, these fish um, grew at a rate where they could um, maintain their body weight and, and remain healthy and, uh, and uh, grow. We had some dispersal of translocated fish from the creeks that vary between Havasu and Shinamu Creek. So on the left here, we have 20% um, of individuals that left Shinamu Creek and were caught, sorry, 20% of the translocated individuals were later recaptured in the main stem Colorado River. And here I've plotted um, the dispersal of distance from the release point, both upstream and downstream. Um, in Shinamu Creek, some of these fish ended up swimming all the way back to the Little Colorado River. Um, much less um, dispersal from Havasu Creek, only about 4% of individuals were recaptured. However, a couple of them were detected um, all the way back, almost 100 miles upstream in the Little Colorado River. So we really wanted to take advantage of the um, intensive monitoring that occurs on the main stem Colorado River by including those um, dispersal um, dispersers detections in the main stem. And so this Barker model is a, an option that's a, a really flexible uh, modeling framework that allows us to estimate true survival and also site fidelity in our translocation sites. And this differs from a more traditional Cormac Jelly Seaver model in that. Um, and it, it, with the CJS model, you can't tell the difference between a fish that has died or one that has dispersed from the stream, essentially. Um, and so we include our recaptures at translocation sites, as well as resites on antennas or um, recaptures outside of the translocation area um, to estimate a, a true survival and site fidelity. Here are some results of um, fidelity estimates for Havasu Creek translocated fish. And you can see they're fairly high, you know, almost 80%, with the exception of this one cohort in 2014. And this was a year where we actually put in two batches of translocated fish, so a really high number compared to the other years. And apparently more of them dispersed. Um, and then over here on the right, we have um, true survival by cohort, including non-translocated fish that we detected in Havasu Creek. Um, relative to um, published survival rates for the Little Colorado River in Turquoise and the Colorado in Olive Green. And you can see that we had really good survival on Havasu Creek. That's the take home message there. Moving on to Shinamu Creek. Um, so we have fidelity, and again, that's much more variable. We had what appear to be higher dispersal rates in general. Um, obviously, after the fire, which is represented by this 
SAS line in 2014, we had um, zero fidelity. Um, but we were able to estimate true survival um, for most years um, after the fire. You can see it, it kind of increased over time, was fairly high, greater than both the LCR and the Colorado River prior to the fire and flood. And then true survival dropped off. And then later on, um, without all those encounters that we were getting in the, in the creek itself, we um, capture probabilities were so low that we weren't able to estimate um, true survival of fish in the main stem for every year. All right, back to the good news. Um, so this is a, a plot that's included in a publication, um, a recent publication that we put together. Um, this is the number of only non-translocated fish by year and their size structure. So as I mentioned earlier, it appeared that we had a handful of adults that were able to um, move past that cascade right in our, um, our first translocation year. Um, and those fish remained in the creek for a while. And we saw evidence of reproduction um, um, spawn, um, adults in spawning condition in 2012. And in 2013, we captured our first um, young of year that were likely produced in the creek itself. And then after about 2015, we saw fairly consistent reproduction and recruitment to adult size classes. So um, it's essentially we established another um, spawning population in uh, Havasu Creek through translocations. I um, wanted to point out this abundance, the abundance of um, humpback chub in Havasu Creek. It's not a really large population. Um, and there are some interesting recent trends here. So once we stopped translocating 2016, we saw those translocated fish drop off. However, um, non-translocated fish did increase, um, except for this slight decline in 2019. And we, we think that was because 2018 was a really poor uh, recruitment year, potentially due to a large monsoon flood. But nevertheless, um, as of October 2019, we did detect a bunch of young of year from the 2019 age class. And so that population um, is remaining and persisting. Next steps for um, translocations include continued monitoring of Shinamu Creek's habitat recovery and the trout expansion. Um, we're beginning discussions on potential trout removal and um, also translocations in the future. Um, in Havasu Creek, we're going to continue monitoring the reproducing population and um, may consider future genetic augmentation in collaboration with the Bureau of Reclamation and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, we're, gonna con we're continuing to remove trout in Bright Angel Creek and monitor the abundance of both native and non-native fish. And we have uh, about 400 fish ready for a second translocation into um, Bright Angel Creek this spring, um, depending on how things go with the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, um, I wanted to close by discussing some of the design considerations and lesson lear lessons learned that we came across during the course of the implementation of this, these projects. Um, first, it seems to be a better option to target sources of non-native fish rather than sink areas. Um, and also along those same lines, we tried to find vulner vulnerabilities in the population, which in this case were spawning areas. So we targeted Bright Angel Creek because it was a known spawning area where fish um, aggregated during the fall and winter months. And also we recognized quickly that we needed to go big or go home. We, we began this effort by suppressing trout in only the first three kilometers or so and realized quickly that trout from upstream are just immediately recolonizing those areas. And also it's important to be realistic and set goals accordingly. Um, we we're uncertain whether this would work and I would hesitate to overpromise to your stakeholders or funding agencies on whether it is a feasible option. And also finally, um, defining measurable objectives is very important. Um, and that's a good way to um, communicate your intentions to stakeholders um, and again, funding, funding agencies. For translocations, um, that initial habitat assessment is really important. However, I wanted to caveat that by, by again mentioning um, the potential for 
less impaired tributaries that are maybe not traditional habitat for larger river fishes as um, opportunities to test conservation actions. Um, and also, um, you want to minimize the impact to your source population. I didn't go into detail on this, but we uh, collaboratively developed a population viability model to, set, to simulate different levels of removal of chub from the Little Colorado River population. And that's why we eventually shifted to um, collecting larval sized fish, which were also logistically more simple to um, deal with. Also wanted to um, mention the importance of reducing potential sources of mortality. Um, again, pointing out that Havasu Creek had almost no non-native fish present, while um, Shinmu had um, a fairly high density of rainbow trout. And ultimately, there was no reproduction there between uh, 2009 and 2014. And again, um, establishing your monitoring metrics and um, really it's really important to adequately fund and monitor um, these actions. Um, during the literature review for the production of our publication, it was apparent that many translocations occur without um, adequate monitoring. And finally, um, again, wanted to point out that tributaries can provide important opportunities for large river um, conservation, large river fish conservation. Um, successful mechanical suppression of invasive fish can be achieved with large scale and, and sustained effort. And also, I think our projects um, contribute towards the understanding of the native fish response to um, predator removal in the context of environmental variability. And finally, um, we hope that this, um, these efforts inform conservation under our um, novel conditions we're faced with today. And with that, I'll um, take any questions if people are still there. Hey, Brian. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Um, so for folks still on, we're going to go a few minutes after uh, with the audio issue, issues. I want to make sure that everyone has time to ask questions uh, if you're interested. So feel free to um, write your questions into the chat box in the bottom right corner of your screen. And I'll just read those out loud to you, Brian. OK. All right, so we have a few uh, questions coming in. So first question, Brian, did bluehead suckers ever show up again in the Shinamu samples? No, um, we think they've been extirpated. We've been sampling Shinamu Creek um, almost twice per year since the fire and flood, and we have not seen them, unfortunately. Great, so this question's from Zach. So Brian, thanks for all your hard work in speaking today. Channel catfish are also quite abundant with humpback chub in the upper basin. Are catfish common in Grand Canyon? And what is your level of concern about potential increases in their abundance and distribution if dam releases and main stem temperatures continue to warm? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think um, over the last 20 years, the fish community in the lower river has changed. When there was um, high densities of catfish, um, we've had the uh, lower lake mead levels and um which has sort of transformed the lower river back from a reservoir into a river and also there's a barrier now at pierce Ferry rapid that may we suspect um keep catfish from invading the system however um i think catfish are a big concern if they were to come back in abundance um in grand canyon i think our work groups are more focused on the risks from things like smarma bass or maybe green sunfish that, that are pop up occasionally. But yeah, those warm water non-natives are a huge concern. Okay, um, so follow-up question, any plans to reestablish bluehead suckers in Shinomo? Uh Yeah, we would love to. I think um, it's worthwhile to attempt to eradicate rainbow trout from that system first. And then that entire watershed could be a, a um, native fish dominated system. And that is definitely in the works. And we've been talking with our partners about those um, opportunities. Uh, Game and Fish is work with us on that. And I believe the Fish and Wildlife Services as well. Yeah, it's definitely in the works. Great. Yeah, so feel free to um, continue asking questions in the chat. 
Um, so yeah, Brian, I have a kind of a general question for you. So uh, yeah, thinking for some of our um, CCAST partners here who might also be, you know, interested in non-native species removal. Um, you know, you mentioned that these three tributaries all kind of have different conditions and different fish assemblages. Do you have any kind of broad advice for folks who might also be considering, um, you know, working in a system with different tributaries? Yeah, um, it seems to me that, you know, I, I, I kind of, I'm kind of hung up on non-native fish <laughs> being present in the system and, and having that kind of dictate what, what you might consider doing. Um, I would suggest trying to remove and suppress non-natives um, or eradicate, ideally, if possible, before um, establishing native fish there. It seems like they're fairly adaptive to the different conditions in the different tributaries, but non-natives could really um, hamper conservation efforts. Uh, I guess the other thing too is just it I can't stress enough that I didn't realize it until I jumped into the li literature that a lot of these projects are not well monitored and um, it's really helpful to establish a really quantitative monitoring plan before it's starting and publishing those results that can help contribute to um, conservation and other systems as well. Yeah, thanks. Um, okay, just my microphone was muted. So a couple more uh, comments and questions. So let's see. So from Eric, uh, Eric writes, uh, thank you for your presentation. Here in Mexico, we have this critical problem. We have a critical problem with pollution around rivers and tributaries. Um, and then Eric also writes later, and I'll get back to a couple of questions in between. Uh, do you have an opinion on how we can deal with pollution problems besides the introduction of non-native species that are being adapted to environmental conditions? So, um, so, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I, we don't generally have those issues in Grand Canyon, but I've worked on issues like that in my career. And I think, um, you know, tr attempting to control the point sources and non-point sources of those um, pollutants is, is a, watershed scale effort that needs to be undertaken, I think. Um, and that's, it's really difficult. I mean, you know, I, in one system we had mining impacts in Colorado and there have been millions and millions and millions of dollars spent to clean the, up the um, sources and it would cost much more um, to take, to, to reduce the pollutants to the point where, um, you know, like native fish like sculpin or cutthroat could survive. And it was really hard to get, um, the entities to do that. So I know it's really difficult, um, but but yeah, that watershed scale and prioritization of sources is probably the, the best way to go, I would guess. Okay. So a couple more quick questions here. Um, we'll go maybe about five more minutes. So uh, about 60 fish moved up from Shinomo to uh, Lower Colorado River. When was the most recent recite at the Lower Colorado? Um, actually, you know, I, I should say that that plot was a little bit misleading because those were detections. Um, so there could be individual fish that were detected more than once. I think it's about a dozen fish that came from Shinamu that went in there into the LCR. Um, I, in the last year, there's been detections there. I can't off the top of my head remember exactly when they were but um they're they seem to be in there pretty regularly um the crews catch them they also have an antenna in the lcr that detects fish definitely okay. in the last year though and to clarify i meant little uh colorado river not lower colorado river for folks here right um Okay, so Stu is asking, uh, how well is the removal of trout accepted by the angling community? That's a great question. Um, the, the, when we started that project, we took a lot of slack for it. I got a lot of angry phone calls. Um, we had a few anglers threaten our folks in the field or over the internet. Um, but it, I think it was a fairly small, major, small number of individuals that were really passionate about that. Um, 
it seemed really important to me to try to um, work towards correcting misinformation that was what was um, included in like online forums and things like that. So I made a point to responding to um, all of those calls and emails with complete answers that corrected misinformation and, and also recognize that um, everyone has different values. And I think you have to recognize that anglers have, might in some cases have different values than that are not as consistent with the mission of the Park Service, for example. Um, and, and, you know, just recognizing that is uh, important as well. Um, but in general, I think the majority, we actually recorded all of our interactions one year, on, I mean, on paper, and the, the majority of them were either um, neutral or supportive of our removal efforts. And, and that, that has kind of died down, especially um, recently. We haven't gotten too many angry phone calls at all. Great. Um, so Anya has a couple, uh, couple questions here and we'll, uh, this will be the last question. Um, so uh, Anya writes, would habitat assessment and trims consider food availability? What other variables could be important, and did the last ass assessment of tribu tributary habitat um, for humpback chub only consider flow and temperature? Um, there's water chemistry considered as well, um, and yeah, there is. We do have invertebrate data for those tributaries. Um, sorry, I kind of lost track of the whole question, um, but I think in general, the the things that came out of the um, recommendations were reliance on the receiving fish community and, and the number of non-natives. Um, and the flow volume was really important too. Um, and that had um, implications for um, genetics. So um, recognizing that you wanna maintain a um, genetically diverse population and the low car carrying capacity in some of those tributaries might not be adequate. Um, so that was a big, Part of it, and I think they also quantified um, recreational use and potential impacts from recreationists. And really, um, in Grand Canyon, that work, those tributaries are the, essentially the largest perennial tributaries that we have. So there's not, even though eight were considered, some of these other trips were were very small. Um, so that flow volume was probably a big driver. Okay, great. So that's just about time. Um, I'm gonna try to share. So I'm gonna share my screen here. Oh, oh I think you're okay. Can you uh, see that? Yeah. Okay, so um, there's some, uh, so here's some contact information just from the CCAS team. If uh, folks have additional questions, feel free to write to, um, to any of us. Uh, so, on that note, um, I'd like to thank everyone today for joining us for the first webinar this spring. Um, especially thank you to Brian for presenting. That was a uh, really interesting presentation. And I think those two different case studies